All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started um, right on time so that we don't get behind. And then if we have some people coming in um, a little late, we can kind of catch them up as we go. The introduction is not nearly as important as the presentation anyway. So um, this stuff can be caught up on, you know, afterwards. Um, but just again, a lot of this will be a repeat for, for many of you. I know there are some new faces though with us today. So uh, just a little housekeeping to start. We are recording today's webinar and it's going to be posted for further reference on our uh, project website. But the breakout rooms will not be recorded, so no worries there. Nothing, uh, nothing will be shared past, uh, past the presentations today. In an effort to decrease our background noise, just please make sure you have yourself muted uh, for now until we get into our breakout rooms and then certainly uh, we would be overjoyed for you to unmute and, and share your thoughts and um, ask your questions there. And we do encourage you to use your video, if not now, um, but definitely in the breakout rooms, once again, I will allow for a lot more interaction there. And if you don't already, go ahead and pull up the chat in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Uh, if you don't see it there, you can take your mouse and just hover down in the corner where you see my mouse. There should be an icon there for um, the chat button. That's how we'll communicate today. Go ahead and put any questions that you have in there. Uh, we will make sure we get them answered, whether we're in the main group or um, in our individual breakout sessions. And then we'll also be posting the link there for our pre and post evaluation uh, survey too. So go ahead and bring that up now. If you're having trouble finding it, um, go ahead and email Mackenzie, who was the one that got you the link to the webinar. She can kind of get you up and running there. Just a little background information for us today. Our, uh, this web webinar is, <clears throat> funded through the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project, which is a project that is funded through the USDA and Northeast Fair. It's a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. We are in the first year of a new three-year project, uh, and this year we're focusing our efforts on pasture management and infrastructure as it relates to sustainable livestock production. This webinar is the third in our webinar series. There's one more following this um, where we're focusing on the development of a grazing plan. And today will consist a lot like, or will be made up of a lot of what we've done in the past where we have some presentations and then also we break out into sessions where we work a little bit more one-on-one uh, -on -one with some more interaction. Um, if you haven't already, those ex that exercise has been um, emailed out to you. And go ahead and make sure you have that answer you want to up on your screen. Um, and that will be uh, very useful for you in our breakout sessions. We, speaking of breakout sessions, just no worries about getting there. Um, we'll take care of all of that in the background. As long as you stay connected, we'll get you to where you need to be um, and into a room. The only other thing I just wanted to remind people of is our certificate of participation. Uh, so for those of you who attended webinar one and two, uh, as long as you attend the fourth webinar coming up on April 6th, uh, as well as participate in at least one of the following, which is attend one of our 2020 workshops or have a one-on-one -on -one follow up conversation um, about your participation in the program, what you've learned or any additional guidance you would like with one of the project staff, which would be myself, Jean King, or Sam Corcoran, uh, you can qualify for that part certificate of participation. Uh, there's more information on our website, and certainly if you have any other questions, you can definitely reach out at any time. I just wanted to mention again that we are collaborating this year uh, on our webinar series with the New England Grazing Network. Um, it is made possible, that network is made possible by the Cedar Tree Foundation which is an organization that is committed to regenerative grazing. So Sam Corcoran is the project coordinator for that. Her contact information is just on the screen. Her contact information is also on the project website. So certainly uh, feel free to contact her at any time if you have further questions or you'd like some more individualized guidance. Uh, she is there to use as a, re a resource. And just real quickly, I'm going to hand it over to Joe Benelli, who is the Connecticut State Fair Coordinator. Uh, he's going to talk about some of the grant uh, funding that is available through Northeast 
there. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and, and welcome to, to the third webinar in, in the series. Uh, uh, just very quickly, uh, and first of all, in, enjoy the great spring weather. I'm, I'm sure you're all getting, you know, doing some things outside, and, and so good luck with the spring season and the summer season as well, as well too. Uh, again, very quickly, uh, these are a listing of all the, the various uh, grant programs that are offered by, by Northeast SARE. Uh, two of no, two quick note would be the farmer grant programs and the partnership grant programs. Uh, the partnership grant programs are uh, the due date for the current uh, application is 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 April 13th. So that's kind of rapidly uh, approaching. Uh, again, that's up to thirty thousand dollars that would be available uh, on partnership grants. Uh, that's where where an ag service provider uh, is working with a farmer uh, to develop basically an, an idea, et cetera. Uh, also, the farmer grant programs, and there's some uh, discussion about, I think, all right, Rachel, about raising the, the limit of the $15,000 grant program as, as well, too. So that should be forthcoming uh, very quickly as well. You'll see there the due dates as well. Uh, program, uh, grant programs you see there. And, and also, I wanted to mention again is that Northeast Air, uh has a, a lot of uh, uh, materials available online as well, too, all sorts of, of uh, resource materials. As well as information on all the grant programs that have been offered in the past years as well as well too. So it's got a, I think, an excellent search engine. So if you're looking for some some research that's been done, uh, maybe some areas you're, you're interested in pursuing on your farm as well, uh, I suggest uh, respectfully again you check out the website uh, for project information. Also, if you have any questions further about the uh, SARE grant programs or SARE resources, uh, please feel free to, to reach out to, to me, uh, Joe Benelli, uh, as well too. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, yeah, so certainly feel free to reach out. So there are um, state coordinators in every state, as this is a tri-state project. So um, Joe is our Connecticut state SARE coordinator. Uh, there is a state SARE coordinator for Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, their contact information is also on our website. So certainly feel free to reach out to them if that applies for you. All right, uh, we're just, we're going to do our evaluation questions uh, the same way that we have in the past two webinars through uh, Slido. So Mackenzie just posted the link a few minutes ago for the evaluation in the chat box. Go ahead now and uh, take that evaluation. Uh, there's a series of questions and then as you scroll to the bottom, you can hit the green submit button uh, or send button and then you can find your way back to, to our screen. I'll let everybody uh, get started on that now. All right, so hopefully everybody had the opportunity to fill those out. If not, um, as we've done in the past, we will make sure that uh, these questions, evaluation questions get sent out in an email afterwards in case you've missed uh, the link or you can't find the link or can't connect for whatever reason. So um, we will get those out to you this afternoon, later on today, uh, so that you can answer those pre and post evaluation questions. Lastly, before we get started today, just want to introduce our speakers, um, both of whom were part of the first webinar uh, and uh, in Jen's case, the second too. Uh, so the faces seem, should seem familiar, but I will introduce both of them um, as I know there are some new faces since we started webinar one. Uh, Damon Mee is our first speaker today. He grew up on a farm in New Hampshire, earning his MS at Michigan State University. He then worked for UNH Extension on the dairy, livestock, and forage crops team. In 2016, he started NRCS as the New Hampshire State Grazing Specialist. In his role, he supports NRCS staff and farmers statewide to further their understanding of their animal and forage management. He is also on the New Hampshire FPAC Beginner Farmer Team and is the New Hampshire NRCS Organic State Contact. Damon is an active member of the Grant State Grazers Board since 2013 and is on the Executive Committee of the Northeast Pasture Consortium. And uh, second is Jen Colby. She's been part of the UVA Center for Sustainable Agriculture's Pasture Program for 16 years and coordinated it for the last 10. Jen has served as the Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference Organizer and developed a long-standing partnership with the Grass Farmers Association. Recently, she managed a UVM team providing technical assistance in the Long Island Sound Watershed and was the co-chair of the Vermont Farm to Plate Network's Production and Processing Working Group. 
She is also an advisor for the Randolph Technical Career Center Agricultural Program, and Jen is taught part-time at Sterling College and Vermont Technical College. She has operated a diverse meat, diversified meat livestock farm since 2000. So with that, uh, I will just stop sharing my screen, give us a minute, and we will get started today. Thanks, Rachel. And Damon and I drew straws, or really, actually, we never talked about it, but, I'm, but we set up, so I'm going to go first. <laughs> And I presume you will let me know if I'm properly sharing. Looking good, Jen. Yes, you're all set, Jen. Awesome. Okay. Beautiful. So um, thank you all for joining us again. And um, <clears throat> Damon and I are really um, excited to both talk about some of the considerations um, to think about when doing fence and water, and then also the design. And so some of the considerations are what you actually put in a place, and then the design is where you put it. So those are both things that are really important to think, be thinking about as you go along. Um, hey, Jen, whoops. just, just yeah. sorry to interrupt you. You're uh, showing your presenter mode, so with the notes on the side, and so it's not a full screen uh, presentation. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, so I should stop sharing and... Away just wanted to make mode. sure you got the full screen view for folks. So if you had anything small on there, they can see. I do not actually have anything small, which is delightful. Um, but what I'm going to do is <laughs> <laughs> we will go this way. There we go. So it won't be the full presenter mode, but that's okay because everything is pretty small. All right, does this work for folks? I think it should. Yeah. Okay, just want to double check. That's an excellent thing to know before we get too far along, always. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> showing, it's just showing your PowerPoint and you're not in, you're not presenting. Are you just going to scroll through the slides? Is that the plan? I'm going to scroll through. That is the safest Perfect. way to not have everybody see multiple things. <laughs> it's very silly to see multiple things. We don't want to do that. It's all good. Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. So there is one other slight thing that I'm going to do just to make sure I don't miss any really smart stuff that I want to tell you. Okay. All right. So we have, oh, goodness. <laughs> Technical issues are not usually my challenge. That's so funny. Okay. We're just going to do that. Um, okay. Thank you so much. We're going to start again. Okay, so there's both what you want to put in your fence, what kind of fence you want to put in, and also where you actually want the fence itself to be. So first we're going to start with considerations and um, with just overview of some different types of fence very quickly, thinking about some other things, the type of fence um, needed for different types of animal behavior or different things to think about when uh, fencing animals themselves. Uh, the land impacts that you have of the fence placement, um, and then a little bit about the interface of fence and water itself. Just a little bit of that part. So when we think about the different types of fence, um, there are lots of different kinds of fence. We've gone over that in past um, presentations. There's certainly electric, um, high tensile, low tensile, there's tape, um, there's barbed wire fence, there's solid fence, there's rail fence, there's all different kinds of fence itself. There's many different types. We'll have some examples here to just look at. Um, but, but when we're thinking about the fence, the different types of fence, we need to be thinking about the different pieces of a fencing system. So we have to think about some sort of an external fence that is essentially uh, a large containment for the animals themselves. We have to think about how we're going to subdivide that fence and what kinds of fence fencing type we're going to need to do create subdivisions. Um, and then we also have to think about there's the grazing system and then there's also um, holding areas or 
places where we need to put animals either to manage them, uh, capture them for shipping, receive them. Um, high tensile uh, fence isn't necessarily what you want animals to be crowded up against in a holding area that, that can actually hurt, be painful. So those are the kinds of things that you want to think about. And then laneways can come into your fencing system um, because you, need, you may need to move animals. You may, may need to move them on, a, on a, um, an occasional basis. You may need to move them on a very regular basis. And so laneways are something that also needs to get included into, and that has a kind of a fencing to it, uh, depending upon what you need there. And then the last thing is the exits and entries of different um, paddocks, holding areas, all those others. We have to think about the different kinds of gates. Um, and what's an appropriate kind of gate. And there are lots of different kinds of gates from just a simple bungee, simple poly wire. There could be tube gates, physical structures, or they could be um, also anything that is electrified is essentially what's going to be called, thought of as a psychological container. Um, animals can push out of electrified um, types of fence, but they don't want to because we've created either negative feedback from the electricity and getting a shock, or we've created positive feedback where they want to stay where they are because they have lots to eat. So those are different kinds of things to think about whether you're in an animal pushing mode or not an animal pushing mode. So this is just a couple of examples of different kinds. You can do um, laneways that are high tensile and um, or low tensile. Sometimes that's a multiple strand. Um, sometimes it can be just a couple of strands. It really depends upon what are your goals for that and uh, what do you actually need and what kinds of animals do you have? So sheep or poultry are often, they do very well in, um, in a net fencing. Um, that may or may not work for other kinds of animals. It's not typical to use a net fencing for um, larger livestock uh, like cattle, um, but certainly can be used for something like pigs under the right circumstances. So and this is an example just of some holding, holding areas where you might want to have animals in a, a contained area for a period of time where um, you're not necessarily expecting that they're going to be moving from that um, every, on a very regular basis. So, and they might be pushing against each other um, or you might be pushing against them to catch them or to do some, some work with them. So having something that's non-electrified is actually quite helpful in those cases. Um, so then when we think about the type of fence, um, we also have to think about animal behavior. And I love this example as um, uh, this, was, this is um, a farm that has in most of the places on the farm, um, and they use a combination of woods and pasture for their pasture pork operation. And in many of the cases, they're actually able to use one strand of, of um, smooth wire or two strands of smooth wire to keep the pigs where they need the pigs to be. The one time when they do something different and they do this in a very specific place is when they wean the piglets and the moms, um, they need a hard fence in between the piglets and the moms. The moms won't break out of a fence anywhere except when they, when they need to get back to their piglets. And that's just a good reminder for all of us that, that that fence is actually only a line. It's not even a closed fence um, that's a big hard fence like that. So just, just to think about fencing the desire. So if, you know, pregnant, pregnant female animals, if they have plenty of food and water, they have no interest in going anywhere necessarily. Um, and if there's not enough food or water, they're driven by a biological need to find that. So that's when they break out of fences. Um, the weaning example is one of them too. And so you get sort of lower um, nutritional need animals. If there's plenty of food in general, they, they're completely fine, except for, you know, so for male animals, lots of times, most of the year, they can be completely fine in uh, certain kinds of fences as long as there's plenty of food and water, except breeding season. So thinking about, that desire, the desires sometimes change and they change for different kinds of reasons throughout the year. So that's just something to think about for type of fence that you use. Um, and then thinking about the, the impacts, the land impacts of fence placement. So, um, and, and the way that animals impact the land. So if you have um, large square paddocks and animals enter from either end, because it's fairly square, then, then they potentially have the ability to spread out and have a lot of wider impact. Um, if you uh, put entry points with long rectangular um, paddocks, 
There's the ability to have more trample depending upon the number of animals. If you don't have a lot of animals, you may not get the trample effect. Um, but they will walk over each other's footsteps in a long, narrow paddock where they will spread out more in a square paddock. So that actually affects how they affect how they impact the land itself. Um, and then when when paddocks are set up across a slope, they can either that can help you target some manure deposition up a slope if you want to. And it, but if the animals are there for a long time, they can also create erosion from walkways across the slope. And it's sort of a similar thing where they, if you put a paddock up and down a slope, they can also create erosion um, by walking up and down the slope. But the benefit of that is that ruminant animals are pretty much the only natural way to move nutrients uphill. So we can mechanically move nutrients uphill, but to get an, a ruminant animal that eats at the bottom of a hill, and as we often know, they camp on the top of a rise or a hill, even if it's small, and so they're moving those nutrients uphill. So there isn't necessarily a right way, but just Sounds like your audio cut out, Jen. Are you able to call in? I just sent you the call-in information if you need it. Hey everyone, are you able to hear me again? Yes. Awesome. That's terrific. That's so interesting. We're just going to go back to this now. <laughs> all right, are you all happy? Am I sharing properly? One hopes. Yes. Looks yep. good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I love technology. It's so great. Uh, anyway, um, so some of those land impacts of fence placements, um, you know, it, there's pros and cons. There's not necessarily a right answer, but there is understanding that um, when when um, the orientation of fence in different ways um, has this interface with the way that animals move, and we can work to our advantage by or disadvantage by moving them or not moving them more often, those kinds of things. Like our management is gonna affect, impact that, but we can also use paddock orientation, sizing and direction to be able to um, work toward our goals and not against our goals. And then we also um, need to really think about the interface of um, fence and water. And Dave is gonna talk about that um, as well and more. Um, but as we think about it, um, we often think about fence first, and the truth is that water is typically much harder to find and much harder to move. Um, and so it's, it's the limiting factor um, in, in a lot of cases. And so really we should be thinking about water before we think about fence. Um, but we'll talk about that later in Damon's presentation. So as we think about the some of the design considerations, um, just some principles that we're gonna to touch on is um, thinking long-term. Don't be constrained by money when you're thinking about this, this design. Think about it in pieces and parts. Um, 
try to be thinking about um, the flexibility over the course of the season and how management itself might change, both yours or someone else's. Um, do your best to ignore existing infrastructure. We'll talk about that. And then um, uh, hit problems uh, hit problems directly or avoid them entirely. So that, that one's a little tough, but it is um, a really, really helpful thing to do. Um, okay, so just thinking long term. Thinking long term is about your why. It is about the goals that you have for this piece of property, for your business, for for um, your your family and your life. And so, thinking long term, the animals you you want now may not be the animals you want later. You might think right now that you absolutely adore llamas and alpacas, and later on you may decide you do not love llamas and alpacas, and you may decide to get into beef. They may require completely different things, um, or it may change. You may change farmers. It may change farmer owners, as we will have in one of our examples. It may also just simply be a change in generation, um, where the next generation doesn't want to do the same thing that the current generation wants to do, even if it's within family and it isn't a sold property. Um, and then you as, you, as you age, you there are things that you might want to do in your mid twenties or your mid thirties or your mid forties that isn't the same thing that you want to do in your mid um, 50s or 60s. And so, so a, a short-sighted grazing system that's really about what we want right now is going to cause a lot more, cost a lot more expense and personal labor, personal labor and um, frustration than something where you're looking at the system and trying to design something that's five or 10 years um, out for what do you think those needs are going to be. It's not a perfect way to approach it, but it is, um, we do our best, right? So don't be constrained by money, and I and I, I hate to put a recommendation as don't be, but the challenge is, and this feels really crazy to say don't be constrained by money because that's the thing that we are all constrained by. However, it's really hard to think long term when we're thinking about money, and there's a, a left brain, right brain part here. Um, as soon as we think about how we are trying to get to something, we stop thinking about what. Like our, our, our one side of our brain takes over and we start to pr solve the problem of how to get to a place. But if we don't figure out where we want to get to first, we're selling ourselves short. And so start with the vision, start with what you want to see. Um, start with a blank map. Uh, start with, with um, going back to what it is that, why did you buy this property? Or why did you come to this property? Or, or if you're looking for a property you haven't found it yet, what is it that you're actually um, looking for? Because if your why drives your what drives your how, you're much more likely to be um, uh, more successful and less frustrated along the way because you've got this um, uh, internal drive and, and view of what it is that you want. So then, think, then solve, figure out what you want and then solve the money issues. And I'm not going to pretend they're not big, but let's not start there. So then also, we have to think in phases, and it's not a bad thing to think in phases. Um, uh, in fact, it's part of how we feed in the pieces to create a whole grazing system. The truth is that most of us don't have the money um, to, to buy an entire system at once, and maybe that's a good thing, actually. We need to learn um, how animals flow. We, it, it, we need to get onto a piece of property and understand how the wildlife flows through it. Um, we need to think about how the water flows. We need to go through some seasons and understand that. And so setting something that gives us a good basis to start with and then growing out year by year by year can really set us up well, especially if we have that cohesive hole that we're working, on, working the edges on. You know, what do we actually need to get the basic system started, and then where can we grow after that? So try to think in phases, if at all possible. Um, so there's also this practical flexibility piece, um, seasonal flexibility piece that we that is helpful for us to think about, too. So um, how are you going to manage it as um, the animal nutrition needs? Um, change. Uh, if you have lambs and moms um, out in the middle of the summer um, and the, the quality of the grass might be declining later in the summer, how are you going to manage that? 
um, how are you going to uh, manage, are you going to move the animals more quickly in the spring? Are you going to move them more slowly as the um, recovery rates um, slow down? Are you going to graze in big pad bigger paddocks in the earlier part of the season and tighten them down to smaller paddocks? Um, do you have, you know, do you have the mechanical means where you're going to um, use as your balancer for too much grass in the beginning? Are you going to balance that out um, or manage it? by using the animals or are you going to um, do you have the mechanical means to hay or to clip or just sort of keep it ahead of the animals um, there's a lot of different things where you have to think about setting up a system that's going to work in june and is going to work in july and august um, because it's not always the exact same system that's going to meet all of those changes in need This is like the toughest one, and we've got a challenge for you when we go into the breakouts, too, is to think about when you're redesigning, ignore the existing infrastructure. Um, we can't change where the water is necessarily, although we can, we can move it, um, and we can't necessarily change where natural landforms are. So starting with the creative side of your brain, and the, that's the right side of your brain, Starting with a blank piece of paper is actually a really great way to do it. And um, and that's the way that, that Damon and I described it. We were actually, if we were doing this in person, we would all be around some flip charts and groups and we would be trying to um, design and draw what it is in you know, different ways that people would um, approach the challenge. Um, and that's not the way we're able to do it. But when you go back and do your own designing, I would totally encourage you to do it this way. Start with a blank piece of paper, really just put on the major landforms. You know, obviously if there are hills, if, if um, there are swamps, those kinds of things, it's gonna be really important to think about that, where the water sources are. And then, and think about, and do your calculations, think about the sizing of, of your paddock needs and, and draw that out and then go back to what is existing infrastructure in there. And what you might find is that it might overlay just fine, it might not overlay just fine. And the thing is, if we were working within the confines of what's already there, our brains also, this is that left, right brain thing again, our left brain wants to solve the problem. So our left brain wants to take that fence post in that exact place and run line off it, when truthfully that fence post would prob might work better 50 feet in a different direction. So it just, it helps us disconnect those two things. And so then the last thing is um, just the, the concept of hitting problems head on or ignoring them entirely. And this comes from Stan Parsons, who is the less well-known uh, uh, co-founder of Holistic Management. And um, just the recognition that when we do things halfway, okay. it just plagues us for, for ages. And we don't necessarily rec recognize um, what, we've, what we've done. Um, and an ex I mean, a, a classic example, and this is a water system example, this is my segue into, into Damon's presentation. Um, I've been carrying water to my pigs for years and it wasn't a big deal. It absolutely wasn't a big deal. And I was able to ignore the fact that I had a halfway measure of, yes, I'm getting water to them, but I'm carrying water to them. I now have too many pigs to, to carry water in any kind of a way. So when I step back, and I'm installing a water system this year. And when I sit back and I think about that, I don't know, hundreds, possibly thousands of hours um, that I might have saved by putting in a water system um, much earlier. It, it just didn't hurt enough. It wasn't frustrating enough to really fix the problem. And so that's something to think about. Either don't do it or completely do it, but this halfway thing will just sort of plague us. So that's part of this long-term thinking. And with that, Happy to turn it over to Damon. All right. Well, thank you, Jen. That was that was really great. Um, I, I um, th there's a lot to think about in there, and there's there's always more that we can talk about too. But um, that's a that's a great great overview. Um, I, I think I did hear someone toward the end come unmuted. So just double check that you are, all are muted, so we don't have uh, background noise. Um, and uh, I will get to sharing. I have too many windows open, so it's going to take me a second to find it. There we go. <laughs> and here we go. So 
That should be showing full screen, I believe. Is that working? All right. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about livestock water concepts. Um, and and I really, you know, Jen hit it right on, you know, effective water systems are really key to in intensifying your grazing rotation um, and making your rotations work in, in general. Um, and as she said, it, you know, it, it really often is the limiting factor for your, your rotation system and what you can actually do with your fencing. Uh, so, you know, um, and the other thing that Jen kind of alluded to as well is inadequate water can put more pressure on your fence. So if you if you want to try and get away with a less robust fence system, um, then making sure there's adequate feed and water is important. Um, and and so I, part of what I'm going to discuss here is talking about what it takes to kind of optimize a, a system. I'm going to kind of go over some other options as well, but um, I'm not really expecting that everyone can get to that optimized system, um, but where you can move towards that optimized system, where it makes sense for you, um, is is something that I would encur encourage because you'll see improvements in your in your grazing and um, and the production that you get uh, as as a result. So, you know, water and performance, um, they, they, they do go hand in hand because of, and, and most of the studies actually with water and consumption and, you know, a, a lot of uh, the water studies on livestock have been done specifically with dairy cattle. Um, but we can still infer some information for, for other classes of livestock. And, you know, if, if the animals have um, poor quality water or limited access to water, then they're, they're going to drink less water, which then inhibits their, uh, or reduces their uh, feed intake um, and reduces their, you, you know, if you're looking for pounds of gain, um, there are studies that show it does reduce pounds of gain. Um, if you don't have adequate water. So a system like this here, where you're relying on a surface water stream um, right near a, a concentrated area of, of manure, you know, you're, you're probably not going to get the best water quality out of that. Um, and as a result, your your production is going to be lower, not to mention the downstream effects of that is, is not ideal. And um, th there's some other problems to having kind of a, a fixed point um, water source that I'll that I'll talk about in a in a minute uh, or right here actually um, so um, grazing and um, the, the the distance to water can really make a huge impact on the uniformity of use so if if the animals have to travel a long way to get to the um, to their water source, then they're going to stay closer to that water source. Um, you know, so th there was a study out in the Midwest. They said, you know, out of a, when they were um, when some beef cattle were seven to nine hundred feet from a water source, the utilization went down significantly, and they out of a um, hundred and sixty acre pasture. Um, they had only even used 130 acres of that pasture. And, and then, um, you know, it, further out west where they do tend to travel longer for water, they saw, you know, 77% of the pasture uh, use is within 1,200 feet of the water source. Even though they had, you know, thousands of acres to roam on, 77% of, of that grazing happened within 1,200 feet of the water source. So it can really affect the how, how willing your animals are to go and use some of the other areas. Um, you know, Jen had talked about some, some long rectangular paddocks. Um, if those are too large and you have water on one end, 
they're not going to get to the other end. They're not, they're, they're not going to graze down at the other end frequently, if at all. Um, so if you, if you want to make sure you utilize all your acreage, then it's important to keep that water close. It's also important to um, recognize that water is is a it draws animals in. Um, so there's going to be higher impact around the waterers. So being able to either kind of armor the area if it's a fixed site, or um, be able to m locate it at different sites each time um, is is helpful in preventing damage to your uh, your pastures. Um, also, you, you need to worry about water, I mean, um, nutrient buildup for potentially water contamination. Um, so really, I, I do encourage people that, that kind of a long range goal of, of everyone grazing should be water in every, every pad with the animals in every paddock. Um, so the the other thing is, um, oh, so uh, sorry, I just added this one in last minute. I forgot about this one. So you, you'll see the the concentrated effect around even this, you know, fairly portable water system. You know, they there is some significant impact right around that water that's chewing up the uh, the ground there. So another part of that uniformity um, or, or distance to water and uniformity of use is that the further you get from water, the less likely the animals are to go and drink, especially by themselves or by one, ones and twos. Um, there's, uh, Cornell did a study that said if, you know, if the water source is within 500 feet of where the animals are grazing, then only about two to 5% of the herd will come to drink at a time. Um, that, and the note here says, you know, shade, minerals, salt, those can also be <laughs> other um, distractions and, and kind of change that a little bit. Um, but also topography factors in because it, it could be closer than 500 feet, but if it's up over a hill and they can't see each other, then that can also cause um, them to want to go more as a group rather than individually. Um, and so this this really has a factor, uh, you know, has a strong impact on the the size of the tank that you can use. And when you're moving a tank frequently, getting it as small as possible while still serving the the water that is needed is um, m makes moving much easier. So you're not dumping a ton of water. You're also not having to lug a huge heavy um, tank around from from paddock to paddock. So, um, you know, some examples of water layouts, you know, this is this is one example of a, um, a setup where you can just have some some branches and each each of these watering points. Whether these are fixed, uh, I would I would say you know it would be better for these not necessarily to be fixed, but you could have some water connections to this supply line, and and then be able to approx put the watering points approximately where they're shown in the. Um, in this uh, example here on the left. Um, and so that way you do have water to each paddock. And so you don't necessarily have to move it every move, uh, every time you move the animals, you know, every, every two times you move the animals, it, it can work. Um, and then you can also kind of have it on a, have a, on a loop. And this one has one supply for each. Um, although I would say, you know, if you had a more flexible system and these weren't buried underground, um, these could be uh, off of the same point here to supply, you know, two different paddocks uh, from the same point. You would just have to move the water, the, the water tank. Um, and then there's systems like this uh, where you kind of have a central water hub with some larger paddocks and, and pastures out um, off of that. 
again, when you start getting to these types of systems, you do start limiting your fencing and your rotation possibilities because you always have to have a way for the animals to get back. Um, so you can do a, lane, a little fencing laneway so you don't, um, so the animals don't graze back on, on grass that they've already grazed as, you know, if you're grazing away from your water. Um, but that's less than ideal and it creates more, more fencing need. So I, I really do encourage people to, to try to, um, you know, try and keep it as movable and flexible as, as possible. That way, that way your grazing system will, will be as flexible as possible as well. So when, when we're thinking about designing a water system, um, there are a number of things that we want to take in, um, we need to think about. And, and you know, I, I want to go over just kind of a, a fairly simple system. If you start getting into more complex systems where there's a lot of demand or um, you're dealing with some gravity flow can be somewhat tricky. Um, or high, you know, lots of uh, elevation change needing to pump up or down or up and down both. Um, so I, as things get more complicated, I would really recommend getting in touch with someone uh, with extension or with um, NRCS that has some experience with um, designing these types of systems. So, uh, but I, I just want to give you an, a general overview of what you what you need in terms of information for yourself thinking of a simple water system or um, if you know what to bring to the person that you're asking some assistance from. So first you're going to need to calculate how much water you're going to need and you know this is these are general averages of um, how much water each animal type needs. And you'll notice, you know, a, a milking cow or a milking goat or sheep is is m more than uh, any of the others um, of the same animal type uh, because milk is made up a large part of water is made up by water, you know, a large percentage of water. So uh, there's a lot of water passing through their system, and you need to make sure you provide adequate water for them. And and that that goes for you know a dairy cow or any any animal that is um, you know nursing their young. Um, so you know you can see there's a quite quite a wide range. You know dairy cows or cattle in general definitely have a lot more demand than than sheep and goats and llamas and alpacas. Um, and so you, you can have a less um, kind of robust system, water system for those that uh, require less water. Um, and, and as Jen said, you know, maybe you've been getting away for, with, with, if you have sheep and goats, maybe you've been getting away with um, bringing water, you know, in five gallon buckets to, to the sheep. Um, and they can, they do get a lot of moisture from grass and, and dew, um, but, uh, you know, so you can get away with it, but if you can save yourself time by setting up a good system, that's, that's, uh, always good. I also just wanted to point out, you know, here's, this is from a, from a study, just kind of focused on this column here, you know, gallons per of water per day when the air temperature increases. So this is with dairy heifers. Um, so, you know, going from 35 up to 95, you know, it's it's quite a significant increase in, in the uh, demand for gallons of water per day. So when you're um, looking at the, your design, I would encourage you to plan for the, the hottest part of the year so that you are, make sure you have the, supply to meet that demand at the more critical time of year. So once you've got your demand, it's also important to know elevations. And, and this is a, um, I, I, I found this out uh, not too long ago that this is possible. So this is uh, Google Earth Pro 
Um, you can download it from on, online onto your desktop, or I'm sure there's some other um, software out there that can do things similar to this, but this is a nice, easy way to do it. And if you go and measure um, and then s select this path and show elevation profile, and you just click along a line of where you want to have your, your supply line run, um, then it, it will show you. So this is um, this is the start point matches here, and this is showing the elevation. So it goes down, and then once it rounds the corner, it starts the elevation starts going back up. Um, so you know that's kind of nice to see. So um, you know if you if you do if it did go down and then back up and down again, if you're dealing with low pressure systems, that can be an issue. Uh, because you can get airlock, um, at, you know, an airlock so that if a bubble gets in the system somehow, it'll get to the peak of that um, that elevation, and and stop the water from continuing on. It it, it locks the water and um, and will cause you to not have supply further on down the line. Um, one way to avoid that, uh, well, one way is having adequate pressure to to wash out the line. Um, and in a calculator, I'll show a little bit later. Um, it has some guidelines for how much pressure you need for pipe size um, to air wash the line. Um, or what you can do is just ha make sure you have a watering point set up there, whether it's a hydrant or a um, you know, just a, a quick connect or something like that. So if you do end up with an airlock, you can release that air at that high point in the line. Um, and that, that should solve the issue at that point. But ideally you'd wanna plan for not having that so you don't have to, you know, <laughs> go out there and discover some very thirsty animals. Um, so, that that can be a really helpful tool, but you can also use contour lines on a contour map, or um, you know, there's there are a number of other tools uh, that you can also use as well. So when thinking about water sources, it's important. You, you know, this this might be easy from a management <laughs> standpoint. You know, the animals can just get to it as as they please, um, but you know, this this water is not <laughs> not very nice um for for the animals to drink um i i often tell people you know to for for the best supply you, you know you want to think if you wouldn't drink it then um then it's too dirty for your animals so uh you you want to make sure you have high quality water uh that is clean and readily available for your animals so a water source like this i, I would not encourage it um e even even pulling from surface water uh, from a pond or a stream, um, it's worth checking to make sure, even at, you know, at the at the hottest time of the year, that that water quality is still pretty good, because chances are there there may be some um, factors to it that are not as good quality. Um, so you know, some sort of groundwater is is often better. So some people also um you know don't want to develop water uh, water source right on site so they pump into tanks and and this can um this can work uh quite well um but it it does involve a lot of um schlepping water back and forth and a lot of time spent waiting for pumps to finish <laughs> pumping um so you know it it can work but you know not ideal, especially if you know you're trying to supply a, a large amount of water. Um, it, it can take a lot of time to move that water around. Um, so there's also solar options. So this is a an example of a solar pump with um, that is pulling out of a, a surface water uh, just over to the out of sight to the left. Um, so that is one option. Um, and then another option is, you know, pulling out of a developed well. Um, hopefully the people that put this in got a wetland permit before doing so. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th there's also, you know, uh, this 
developed well type option. Also, drilled wells work quite well. Water quality sometimes can be a little bit questionable in, in these uh, shallow wells. So making sure that you um, have good clean water and, and um, have flushed it out um, is, is also important. Um, and then, so pressure, you know, pressure is really important um, when we're when we're talking about these watering systems, because um, you know, if you have too low pressure, you you end up not getting enough supply, or it can't keep up with the demand, and then the trough is empty, and then the animals knock it over, and then you got water flowing onto the ground, and then you don't notice it until it's a you know, big quagmire out there. Um, but also, if you have a, you know, if you have either go up and then down, or just down from your your pressurized water source, or, or un even unpressurized water source, down toward the bottom, you can you can get some pretty serious pressures and um, have problems with valves closing um, or uh, hoses expanding, um, that that sort of stuff. I'm realizing I'm uh, running late on time, so I'm going to speed up here a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so with with uh, that, I, I really encourage you know pipeline is is really the way to go. Polyethylene pipe is is a inexpensive way to move water efficiently, um, going long distances. Um, and in terms of the flexibility part, um, I I try and encourage where where it makes sense as much as possible run the pipeline above ground, usually along fence lines or where it's not gonna get grazed as tight so it can have some shade from the grasses so the, the water stays cooler. Um, but, but really, you know, burying them where needed, where, you know, might be getting driven over or, you know, something like that, or you need water where um, it's gonna be, you're gonna need water when it's colder than, than freezing out. So, um, but as much as possible, leave flexibility in your system and and leave your lines above ground as much as possible. So fittings, uh, making sure you have good quick connect fittings can really make a big difference. So you only have to have one or two tanks and just, uh, you know, do a quick um, uh, disconnect, move the trough and and uh, reconnect at the next one. So these, these types of fittings are, you connect it, this is the supply line, and then um, you just stick this in there. This clip goes over the flange and there's a ball valve in there. And once you stick it in, it's, you've got pressurized water going to your, your float valve in your trough. Um, so there's another picture of that. One thing about float valves, um, these are these types of float valves are fairly common. This red one down below, um, they hang over. Uh, this uh, red thing down below is the float, and uh, it hangs over the side of the trough. I I see a lot of problems with these though, because if your trough is not level, um, especially if this is on the upslope side, you're going to end up with overflowing water. And um, then also animals, you know, if it's within reach, they'll probably try playing with it at one point or, <laughs> or another. So having it up top is, um, is not, it, it kind of opens yourself up for more problems. So what I, what I really recommend is some sort of uh, valve with a float on a, on a string or a chain um, down, down at the bottom of the um, bottom of the trough. And so then uh, in terms of trough size, so um, this is kind of the, the conservative side, you know, wanting to make sure that you have enough water, you know, uh, for the animals. And I'll show an example right at the end here um, about, you know, why uh, or how you might be able to get away with less, um, but it comes down to management and observation. Uh, so, so a, a good rule of thumb, though, is for for a minimum trough size is about two gallons per head of cattle, or about one gallon per head of sheep or goat. That might be a little on the high side, you know. Jen, you might be cringing at that, <laughs> but um, but you know that's uh, us at NRCS are you know a little on the conservative side when it, when it comes to that because um, you know, we want to make sure there's enough water and and we don't know exactly how folks are going to be planning on managing things. 
Um, so, but I will say, you know, it is possible to go smaller for some. So this is an example of um, some some uh, kind of high density grazing. So this is um, 60 ewes, 90 lambs, and two dogs in July. And, um, you know, it's set up with a small water tank and, and this little water down, down in the bottom is really all that is providing water for those all, all those sheep and the two dogs. So, um, it, you know, what this requires though is vigilant attention to the, to the animals, you know, make, make sure you pay attention to the water system, make sure they have enough, um, make sure it doesn't get knocked over, um, and you know, make sure there's there's good supply going to that. And this is just a gravity feed system trailer is just parked above the the water trough. Um, so it is possible to have something this small, but um, it it can be it it can be um, uh, well, it takes just more attention to the details and if you're not ready for that then sizing more with a with the um with these uh size guidelines um that i think are are a better way to go um so with that i am uh, just a little bit over time i apologize um but i will um stop presenting And I think we're right. planning on going into the breakout sessions now. Yep. So, Damon, just real quick, I, I checked, double checked with Jen too, because we're, uh, like you said, a little past time. Do you want us to um, kick that breakout session out a little longer or still keep it to what we had originally planned? Um, I, I, I covered what I needed to cover. So, I, we, can, we can go ahead. Okay. Okay, so then what I'll do is I'll um I'll have I'll have Mackenzie keep us in our breakout room till about eleven forty rather than eleven thirty five or so, um, and then we'll come back circle back to you for um, the water infrastructure example. Sound good? Yeah, no, I I can go through those pretty quick and um, and we'll okay. be able to make those available to folks after after the fact. They're just little calculators that I can show an example of. So perfect, um, perfect. All right, so then Mackenzie, go ahead and break us into our groups and we'll stay there until 11.40 or so. All right, welcome back everybody. I hope everyone uh, was able to find that fairly effective. I know that Damon and Jen put in a lot of time to, to make our virtual setting as educational and useful as possible. So um, I think at this point, uh, unless, maybe I'll mention one thing. If, if anybody has any questions that didn't get answered in the breakout session, feel free to enter them into the chat. If we don't get to them right now, I will make sure that I get you in connection to the right person after the, the workshop is over today. So certainly feel free to enter those in as we go. And in the meantime, I think I'll hand it over back to Damon and he can get us um, the information we need a little bit more on some of the water infrastructure. Great, thanks, Rachel, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed those breakout sessions. So um, there was a lot to cover there. Um, so first, um, so we'll we'll make these uh, available um, if you want to do some calculations. Um, first, I'll I'll share this um, little calculator Jen shared with me, um, and. Um, so <laughs> there was a lot that I didn't go into, you know, there's, uh, if you, if you talk to an engineer about, um, the designing these water systems, um, at least my eyes glaze over pretty quickly. There's all sorts of variables and formulas and <laughs> everything. So I figured it'd be best not to uh, get into that, um, uh, you know, the details of it, but what you can do is use a calculator like this to just kind of make sure that you're, you, your the components of your system are going to work for what you want it um, want it to do. So, in this one, um, where there are red uh, numbers uh, numbers or um, letters, that that's where you input values. Um, so, starting with the source pressure. So, ha you know, what's your pressure pump? Um, you know, what what's that pump pushing out for pressure? 
Um, uh, common well pumps are 20, 20, 40, 40, 60. Um, and um, so, some are, some get a, a little bit higher than that. Um, uh, 30, 30, 50 as well. So um, no, knowing that pressure is important for this. You also wanna know where your source elevation is and um, where that, uh, that's where kind of that, if you have a pressure tank, that's where the pressure tank is. And then what, what's the, um, what's the end point elevation, but also, you know, if there's a high point where you are, especially if you're pulling water off at that high point, um, that, that elevation is, is important. Um, will a float be used? And, um, and then those, the, there's generally information about the, um, the kind of minimal pressure required to operate that float. Uh, so you need to find that about the, the float valve on the trough and, and input that there. And then you can, you can select your, your pipe size here. Um, because conveniently the, the actual pipe size is uh, the interior diameter is slightly different than what, what it's actually called. So then there's the fun Manning's N, which is a, which is a you know, ask an engineer if you wanna get put to sleep, uh, what Manning's N is, um, but conveniently the, the numbers are put here. So if you are looking at plastic or copper, you've got you know, this 0 0.009 factor you just plug that in there and then how long is your how long is your pipeline so once you en enter all those things um i i found out at least with the version i downloaded uh it, it just goes ahead and calculates it as you edit things and pressing these buttons um <laughs> that uh make it mad so i wouldn't press those buttons um so then it, it will spit out available head pressure and and then what the flow rate is and what the flow velocity is so those two things are helpful in planning your design um, the available head is saying um, okay you've got this much extra pressure um, so that that feet of pressure is um, at the at the end of your pipeline when there's um, you know the, the manning's end is the the friction of the water passing through the pipe um, you know, accounting for that. Uh, and then, you know, the, your, your pipe length and um, your elevation, all that goes into at the end of your pipeline. If you had a, uh, an open pipe standing straight up in the air, it would push that water up 13.8 feet. Um, so that's kind of like the, the extra pressure that you have uh, at, at the end there. And so that's, that's good to have. So make sure you have, have good extra pressure there. Um, and then, as I mentioned here, um, these are the minimum air flushing velocities for for the different size pipes. And so that is so generally like for so we've got the one inch pipe. If we th there may be a chance that we have some airlock issues if we have a high point and then come back down. Um, because we are at a flow rate of 3.2 gallons per minute. If we were up to 3.6 uh, or over, then then we wouldn't have to worry about those uh, the the airlock um, quite so much. Um, you know, as you get lower in in flow rate and pressure, these the 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 topography and the the variability um, are, are really going to come into play. Uh, a lot more significantly, your room for error is is a lot uh, a lot smaller. So going with a higher pressure um, uh, can and, and a higher flow rate can be can be quite helpful. Um, however, you also want to be careful of what the velocity is um, because uh, you know if you end up with a fairly high velocity uh, coming down a slope um, and when that when that um, valve shuts off you can have that column of water slam into the into the valve and create a water hammer effect and so that sends shock waves back through the system which um, if it's strong enough or if it happens uh, for long enough um, it can push apart connections and and uh, create some leaks so that's 
something to uh, to consider. Um, so that's it's a nice simple tool can kind of give you a general idea. You know, if you have this information to put it in um, and say, okay, you know, that's that's great. Um, and I did another one here, you know, with a with a higher flow rate, less less elevation, so you end up with a higher flow rate. Um, so you know this this is uh, you know another another system that can work. You can also kind of play around with you know if uh, if it was 20, 20 psi. Oh, it looks like it's still still okay there. But if if the low pressure uh, on this pump was was uh, twenty, nope, that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to get water to the end of it. So so it'll tell you that, um, and it'll get grumpy at you with some of the formulas in the background of <laughs> of Excel here too. Um, so I won't get into it really, um, but there is one more tool that we will we will make available. Um, I will just share it real quickly so you can just get a view of it. Um, and this has this has good information on it. Oops, I'm scrolled down to the bottom. So this is uh, something that we put together in New Hampshire for our planners that are putting together a fairly simple um, pipeline system. And if you want to know what a fairly simple pipeline system is, you know that, that's kind of we put the criteria in this acceptable scenario range. So uh, once you get out out of those ranges, like a 50 foot drop or a 75 foot lift from the pressure tank, um, then then you might start wanting to think about talking to someone with a bit more expertise. Um, so uh, then there there's more information you can kind of step through, you know, your your planning process and kind of it's a, it's a little bit of an inventory of what people have as well. Um, so that that can be a helpful tool um, that we'll share with you as well. And with that, I will stop on time this time. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, take it away, Rachel. Thanks, Damon. Um, so real quick, I know we're just getting ready to wrap up here. If anybody has any questions, I know I've just mentioned it, but I figured that I might not catch everybody. Uh, certainly feel free to enter it in the chat. Now we have a few extra minutes today that we can, um, address some of those questions while we have everybody on the line. Um, in the meantime, maybe I'll actually see if I want to shoot it back to Damon real quick. Do you want to share any information with us about the um, training session that's coming up in April through the New Hampshire um, Granite State Graders? Yeah, sure. The, um, yeah, we're doing a um, starting on Wednesday, the 31st, uh, Granite State Graders is putting together a training uh, a four, four part series um, uh, about grazing, grazing management, um, kind of kind of the basics and, and kind of background reasons why we choose to do uh, uh, grazing management in the way that we recommend. Um, so I will put a link to that in the chat. Um, and it's, uh, it's designed for NRCS employees that want more background as well as producers that want to get a better idea of, um, you know, how, why, why we want them to manage a certain way um, to, to get the best grazing um, out of their out of their land and the best production from their animals. So um, the first one is uh, on on the 31st is about um, that's about a kind of basics of ruminant nutrition and a little bit about grazing behaviors. And and so kind of talking about why animals choose to graze in, in the um, ways that we the ways that they do so. And then we'll we'll go from there. But I'll I'll put a little link to it in the chat. So thanks, Rachel. Awesome. Good. Um, let's see what else is on my mind. I wanted to mention um, since we have a few extra minutes, which we don't normally have, I'm like, oh, what can I say? Um, <laughs> we will have some field training workshops coming up uh, this summer through our Tri State Fair project. Um, dates and such have not been established yet, but certainly we will keep everybody posted as we go along here. Um, 
I also wanted to mention too that one of my colleagues, uh, Jean King, will be reaching out to a lot of you all as participants this year to help understand um, what more you'd like help on, uh, what else our project can do to better serve you as um, a service provider or a, a farmer. Uh, so she will be reaching out in the coming weeks um, as we're wrapping up this webinar series. Um, let's see, did anything come through the chat? Uh, I see Jim wants to mention some information about uh, some grazing sticks. So absolutely, Jim, go ahead and, and jump on and take it away. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, we had mentioned this in small group, uh, but I just wanted to share with, with the larger group as well. Uh, Rachel has done uh, just an incredible job of organizing all this stuff. And one of the things that comes along with that is we've talked a couple times now about the grazing sticks. And uh, so we have in, in Connecticut, excuse me, in Connecticut, we've sent out a, an email to the uh, the field offices uh, just forewarning them that uh, this Rachel's go, uh, Rachel has this uh, training going on and people may be asking about grazing sticks. So. We've, with all the Connecticut offices, we sent an email out uh, asking if grazing sticks are available. Uh, we sent out instructions with the grazing sticks uh, so that that can be emailed or attached to the stick as well. Uh, so uh, if people are interested in a grazing stick, just know that uh, you can reach out to your local NRCS office um, and they can work to set up a time to either meet you or, or figure out a way to get that stick and instruction to you. Uh, and any questions, don't hesitate to reach out at any point. Awesome, thanks, Jim. I'll, um, what I usually do as as the project continues through through the year is send out some correspondence emails to everybody who has participated. In one of those, I will make sure that I include the, um, NRCS has a handy little um, link uh, landing page there where you can find your local office. So I will make sure I get that included and you guys can contact your most local office um, to, to be able to get a stick uh, and utilize it for your grazing needs. Um, and at this point, I think maybe what I'll do is ask Mackenzie to put the, um, a link for the evaluation, the post evaluation into our chat uh, so that people can kind of find their way there and answer those questions for us. Um, and I see something coming in from Susan that's talking about the fact that there's some good YouTube videos um, out there that show folks how to use uh, the, the pasture sticks as well. So what I'll do is I'll make sure I kind of pull all of this together for you all and get it out in my correspondence email. So it's kind of all in one spot. We don't all have to go searching and looking around too much. Um, the other thing I'll follow up with is our fourth webinar in the series will be on April 6th. It's another Tuesday. Um, it is from 10 to 12, just as the other three have been. Uh, we will be covering kind of um, contingency planning and, and adjusting your grazing plan and, and thinking about the future. So uh, we will welcome back Damon uh, and Jen and Susan again for that webinar. Um, and, and we're looking forward to, to that. Is there anybody else that has any other questions, any thoughts, anything they want to share today? All right. Well, then as, as we wrap up here, I thank you all for joining us again. I hope that you found it very effective and useful um, in, in attending today. Please fill out the post evaluation. If for some reason you can't find it, we will send out that link again after uh, the webinar is over. Um, otherwise, we hope to see you all on the line again on April 6th. Thank you, everybody.